Hello and welcome to Stand in the Gap. I'm Sam Rohr, and I'm going to be joined again today by Pastor Isaac Crockett. Now, if you've previously joined us on this program, you know that we examine key issues that I refer to as transcending cultural issues impacting America. Now, specifically, we try to identify those issues which challenge the Judeo-Christian or biblical worldview framework, which underpins our Constitution, our civil laws, and therefore directly impact our civil freedom and the ability to freely communicate the gospel of Jesus Christ. Our purpose is to demonstrate that while life is full of problems and challenges, there's no controversy or any problem, personal or national, that God's Word does not address it and provide the remedy. On this program, we don't seek controversy, but we do seek to resolve controversy. We don't seek sensationalism or alarmism, but we do seek honesty, education, and calming confidence by clearly presenting the truth of God's Word. Now, the theme of today's program goes to the very core of all controversy, not only in this nation, but around the world. And if I were to ask you right now what you would identify as the most significant controversial issues facing America today, you may well say, well, racial division or borders and immigration, or the rise of socialism. You might say the scourge of abortion, or human trafficking, or drug or opioid addiction, or bribery or corruption in government. And I would say, while all of these would be true, and we've dealt with all of these issues on this program, I submit that these are but symptoms. They're not the root problem. The root problem and the core of all of these challenges and controversies and problems we face revolve around one thing, or more accurately, one person. And that is the person of Jesus Christ. You know, since the Garden of Eden, when the most eloquent and powerful skeptic of all times, the devil, came to Eve and asked the, her this question, hath God said, and then planted the seeds of doubt in her mind and that of Adam, in regard to God and who He was and the fact He had just made them, but ultimately question and put in mind the doubt about Jesus Christ, the one promised as the Redeemer in the beginning, and the one who ultimately came to earth and was born to die. That Jesus, that Redeemer, is the hinge point of controversy. Disagree with God about who He is and who Jesus Christ is, and there is division and controversy agree with God about who He is and who Jesus Christ is, and there is sweet unity, and there's healing, and there's singular focus. This is why we speak so regularly about understanding the pillars of a biblical worldview of God, the creation, fall, and then redemption. So in an age of skeptics and division, is it enough to prove that Jesus was real and that there was a real person in history called Jesus, or is more required than historical facts. Our theme for today is believing in Jesus more than historical assent. Our special guest today as we look at this significant issue will be Dr. Dylan Burroughs, co-host of Truth for a New Generation and also senior writer for the John Ankerberg TV program. Isaac, well, great to be back with you again today on Stand in the Gap. Yep, same. Always good to be here. Uh, Isaac, let me go to you first as we set up this important program today. Uh, you don't have long to answer this, but I want you to set it up. The, f the title is Believing in Jesus. Now, we're dealing with a generation that doesn't even recognize that God is God and God is creator, biblical worldview we talk about. But I want you to just expand a little bit because we want to define our terms as we go through. Uh, talk to me a little bit about the difference between uh, believing in in Jesus, which is our title, versus perhaps believing about Jesus or believing on Jesus. Right, yeah, so, you know, Paul talks about believing in Jesus and thou shalt be saved. And so a lot of people know about Jesus and they may be only focusing on one little piece they know about him or they think they know about him and that's what they focus on. But they, and I've even known people who didn't profess to be Christians at all who knew a lot about the historical 
uh, life of Jesus Christ, the historical Jesus. But in the Bible, Jesus says, if you really want to know me, if that's a relationship. And I think this whole program, we're going to get into this more. But uh, in John 14, he says, our hearts shouldn't be troubled. If, uh, if we believe in God, we believe in him. And he says, uh, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father mm-hmm. but by me. And so I think there's this idea of accepting Jesus for who he says he is, not just that he existed, but that we come to God. We can't come to God without coming in, in, you know, into him. Which is, which is what the scripture says, Isaac. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto my Father, God, unless they come to me. That's a narrow way. And ladies and gentlemen, that really is the source of controversy. Is Jesus God? Uh, can we just know about him? Or must we believe in him? Stay tuned with us. We're going to come back. We're going to delve into the subject with Dr. Dylan Burroughs in just a moment. Truth, flexible or permanent? The Bible, ancient history or powerfully relevant? Culture, a reflection of enlightenment or warning signs? The pastor, commentator or frontline combatant? Every day, American Pastors Network speaks to these questions where and when they matter. With hundreds of affiliate radio stations nationwide, a website and mobile app screening today's headlines through the twin lenses of the Bible and the Constitution. Educating, informing, equipping. This is the American Pastors Network. The time is now to stand in the gap for truth. Hello and welcome back to Stand in the Gap. We are talking today about uh, believing in Jesus more than historical ascent. And to help us walk into this, I want to invite in right now our special guest, Dr. Dylan Burroughs. Uh, who is co-host of Truth for a New Generation and also a senior writer for the John Ankerberg Show, which I'm sure many of our listeners perhaps have seen. Uh, Dylan, welcome to the program today. Great to be with you today, Sam. We've got a big topic, and we don't have long to talk about it, so we're going to delve right directly into it. Dylan, you uh, work for the Dr. Alex McFarland Ministries as well, Truth for New Generation. You deal with uh, apologetics in order understanding God's Word, how to express it to a skeptical generation perhaps. Let me dive right into the heart of this matter here right now and ask you this question. Can a skeptic, a person who does not yet believe in Jesus, um, can that person, can that skeptic, does he have to start with understanding perhaps who God is, the the God of the Old Testament? Uh, Or can he start with Jesus, but mix these two together because uh, they are intricately connected, Jesus and God, correct? Yes, they are. And in a general sense, over 90% of Americans still believe in God or some kind of higher power. They just can't agree on who God is in our culture. And our goal is usually moving a person from skepticism to belief, or in other words, from a general idea of God to considering whether Jesus is God. For example, Muslims believe Allah is God, but they define him much differently. In Islam, he is a prophet, but nothing more. He's certainly not God's son. But the early disciples used two key pieces of evidence that we still use today. And first is our personal testimony. They were eyewitnesses and shared what they had seen and heard, just like we do today. But second, they used scripture. The Old Testament prophecies regarding the Messiah stood as their evidence for Jesus. And still today, these two areas are important. We must share the story of how God has changed us, as well as show the evidence that supports our faith. But I would also say that an added ingredient with younger generations today is building a trusting relationship through which to share this information. Because with so much fake news and competing ideas out there today, building trust is often the key factor in opening doors for successfully sharing our faith. Dylan, um Thanks so much for being on the show with us, Ed. You talk about uh, fake news or, or incorrect information being out there, especially our, our younger generations are susceptible to that. But I think all generations are susceptible to, uh, to, to lies or misinformation. Ed, so one of the things is how do we you know, 
talk to people who maybe don't believe that Jesus even existed. It seems like that is a very narrow group of people. Even many atheists that I know, very few, if any of them, would claim that he didn't exist. But uh, there, there is an article here uh, from a lecturer in the Department of Religious Studies. He's uh, Australian, uh, University of Sydney. And uh, it's a couple years old now, but the title of this article is, Did Historical Jesus Really Exist? The Evidence Just Doesn't Add Up. And here's some of what he wrote um, in this article. He said, Did a man called Jesus of Nazareth walk the earth? Discussions over whether the figure known as the, quote, historical Jesus, end of quote, uh, actually existed primarily, um, these, he says, these discussions primarily reflect disagreements among atheists. Believers who uphold the implausible and more easily dismissed Christ of faith, the divine Jesus who walked on water, they ought not get involved. They shouldn't be involved in discussing the historicity of Jesus Christ, he says. Now, this claim is kind of absurd, maybe bizarre to say that a, a believer can't have a say in the history, you know, looking historically and at artifacts and things. Uh, that, uh, but, however, to his point, that the evidence of the historical Jesus doesn't add up. It, it doesn't seem to run with what most Americans see. And, and in my experience dealing with those who have studied history, uh, you don't seem to come across this point of view. But um, how compelling are the facts, the historical facts, supporting that Jesus Christ really was a historical person that, that has even most skeptics admitting that he was a, a real person? Sure. And to answer the question of the Australian scholar, it's interesting that in order to win the game, he has to change the rules, so to speak. So you change it to your favor and then you win the advantage. But it's important to note that virtually every religious scholar, whether Christian or otherwise, accepts the basic historical facts about the life of Jesus. I had the opportunity to interview Dr. Gary Habermas recently, who's considered the world's leading authority on the evidence for the resurrection. And he notes the majority of scholars accept the five following facts. First, that Jesus lived, he was a historical person. Second, that he died on a cross. Third, that he was buried in a tomb. And that fourth, the tomb was soon empty. And then fifth, this is important, that many people claim to see him alive again. So the question is not truly whether he existed. Most people accept that. The question becomes, what is the best explanation for the accepted evidence? Now, there have been some bizarre alternatives over the years. If you look into it, there's this idea called the swoon theory that claims that Jesus somehow passed out on the cross and later woke up in the tomb and then somehow miraculously escaped. Now, the most common story is still by skeptics that the Jewish uh, accusation that we find in the New Testament of the disciples stealing the body. But this one is difficult in light of several other facts we see in the New Testament and in history. For example, the Roman guards were at the tomb. First and foremost, if you were scared disciples, running away from Jesus when he's arrested, you're not going to go and try to take over a bunch of Roman guards at a tomb. But then second, the disciples all proclaim the resurrection and most were willing to die for this belief. And then third, many others in addition to the disciples claim to see Jesus alive, including over 500 people at one time that we read about in 1 Corinthians 15. And then this is important that all this was documented within the lifetimes of the key eyewitnesses. This was not something that was far-fetched legends centuries later. This was all within the lifetime of the eyewitnesses and gives it a very high level of credibility as a result. Well, Dylan, let me come back to you on this. Expand a little bit on the evidences. Uh, you've named some right now. Expand on where you want to go. If I were to ask you, uh, Dylan, as someone who speaks often with young people who don't really have a biblical worldview, many of them, or skeptics, as we're talking about, who don't believe that God is or Jesus was. What, do you, what have you found to be the most compelling proofs of the veracity and the historicity of Jesus? What I've enjoyed in my interviews with Dr. Gary Habermas is that he shows in modern New Testament studies that skeptics have been largely challenged by what is known as pre-Pauline events. In other words, Paul became a Christian about three years after the resurrection and claimed to teach the same gospel as the other apostles. And then he met some of these apostles within about five or six years after the resurrection, according to Galatians, a book that even skeptics accept as authentic. And again, this is far too short of a time to fabricate legends. These were eyewitness accounts. But a second area that many people aren't aware of, even though it continues to grow in evidence, is the biblical data itself. For example, in just the past 20 years, more than 50 additional New Testament manuscripts have been identified. 
We have pictures of them. We have evidence of them. We can compare them with other manuscripts to give us a better idea of what the earliest text said. And text, technology helps us compare these. There are also now over 5,000 plus manuscripts of just the New Testament that show us the accuracy of the biblical tradition. And the Bible has a far greater quantity and quality of manuscripts than any other ancient book. And I say now that skeptics may reject the claims of the Bible, but they can no longer reject the content of the Bible itself. Hmm. Hmm. So that, that brings us to an interesting point. Then if they can re, uh, can't reject the claims that Jesus was a real person, um, then let's go back to the beginning question Sam you posed to me. Now let's pose it to you, Dylan. Uh, so what is this? What is the, the, the real crux here, the real important part is, what is the difference between believing in a historical Jesus, believing about Jesus, even studying him as a historical figure, which is allowed, you know, almost anywhere, even in, in the culture we live. But uh, the moment you say he's the way, as Sam quoted, he's the truth, he's, he is life. There's no real life without him. Now, all of a sudden, the brakes get put on. So what is that difference between believing about Jesus and believing truly in Jesus? Yes, as you mentioned, in our culture, it's popular to believe there are many ways to heaven or many ways to God. So when you take that stand that Jesus is the way, the truth, the life, as Jesus claimed himself in John 14, 6, you've taken it to a different level. So the bias is not necessarily against the historical facts, but against the claims of Christ. And a person who refuses to believe these facts does not do so because the resurrection is too hard to believe somehow. It's because it stands against their personal bias or against their own worldview. Another way to put it is, I don't want to believe because I would have to change who I am and how I live. So a person might believe that Jesus lived, that he was an important person, but they reject him as Lord. And as you mentioned, there's a big difference because scripture is clear that to be saved, we must believe he is Lord and that Jesus rose from the dead. That's the message that is summarized in Romans 10, 9 and 10. And it's a summary of the apostles' teachings throughout the New Testament. It's an essential difference that Jesus is not a way or a God. He is the God. He is the way, the truth, the life. And he claimed to be the only way to heaven. Well, Dylan, and uh, in reality, um a person, you and me and Isaac, we believe in Jesus. We believe that He is the Son of God, the Redeemer. But I was not there when He walked the earth. I can read my word, the Bible that's before me, but ultimately, uh, and speak to this, I ultimately must believe that Jesus is God by faith because it is by faith that we believe. I want you to expand upon that a little bit about the element of faith, Dylan, which appears to be uh, something that is extraordinarily difficult for many who perceive themselves to be educated or uh, smart in this world. Uh, speak to that a little bit because that aspect of faith is hard to kind of get your hands around, but it's an essential ingredient, isn't it? It really can be, and faith is simply another word for belief. And for the educated person, believing in Jesus as Lord or God, it's a humbling decision. It's a matter of pride. I think in the New Testament of the rich young ruler who wanted to be saved. And when he did, Jesus challenged him by telling the man to leave his possessions and follow him. And in that case, the man chose to leave rather than to follow Jesus. And I look at the situation of our culture today. There are many people who want heaven but they're not willing to give up their own little heaven on earth for the greater treasure mm. of following Jesus. That is the difference. It's why it's easier for a child because you have mm. that simple childlike faith rather than having to give up the things that you have in this world for something that's far greater. Now, ladies and gentlemen, you're listening to a discussion today about believing in Jesus more than historical ascent. As, we've, as you've heard, the facts about Jesus coming, d being born, living, dying, being crucified. That's all there. That's established. Hardly anybody can refute that. But that is not the same thing as believing in Jesus as your singular way to heaven. Now that's by faith. And as Dylan, uh, Dr. Burrs and I were just talking right now, uh, Dylan, I just want to share one thing that I've learned in raising five, uh, six children actually, and uh, a lot of grandchildren now, as we're dealing. One of my grandsons just trusted the Lord this week. 
and my wife and I have talked much about this, and ladies and gentlemen, you, you may understand what I'm saying. When dealing with adults, faith is the most difficult. You can believe in our head. With children, faith is very easy, but having enough knowledge can be the difficulty. And that has to be kept in balance as we approach who this Jesus is, claims to be, I am the way, the truth, and the life. It is that that is a choice that makes us so controversial. We believe in God, we agree with God about Jesus, we're unified. We disagree with God about who He is and who Jesus is, that's controversy. That's what we're talking about today. When we come back, we're going to conclude this program talking with Dylan Burroughs, hear a little bit more about how now we talk to those who are skeptics, understanding that they may be able to understand intellectually that Jesus was here, but having difficulty in making that step by faith and believing that Jesus is, in fact, who He said He was, the Son of God. Stand in the Gap is produced and recorded in the studios of WBPH Philadelphia, positively different television. To watch archives of this program, go to WBPH.org. Welcome back to Stand in the Gap. As we now enter into our last segment, we're going to try and make this a, as we do often, a practical application. We've already learned that uh, knowing about Jesus is not the same as believing in Jesus. And Dylan, I'm going to ask you in just a moment how we can more effectively relate to those who are skeptics, who have not yet come to Jesus in faith. In just a moment, I want to read a couple of verses here uh, that I think of. Psalm 19 says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows His handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. And then I think, Dylan's of Romans chapter 1 that ties in very similar to that. It says in Romans 1.20, for the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world, just referring to the verse I just read from Psalms, are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they, people, are without excuse. Because when they knew God, people were talking about, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their own imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. So, Dylan, God has made it very obvious in His creation that He is, and Jesus came and said, I am He, the one promised. How do we more, most effectively now deal with those who can see what God's created, but don't want to believe that Jesus, the Redeemer, is in fact God the Creator? Well, I believe Jesus gave us the best example because He began with a relationship. He came to us when we were still sinners. He lived among people and He showed love. And this is an example for us. If we want to influence others for Christ today, we must be willing to build a relationship with unbelievers, that trust that's bonded between two people that opens a door to share more about the God in whom we believe. A second thing that is often left out in our culture is to be willing to endure criticism. We live in a liking type of culture where we want everybody to like what we do. But I tell people, if you're not being criticized in some way, you're just not doing it right. 2 Timothy 3.12 says, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. So we should expect it. But then third, we share Christ in God's power. The same Jesus who said, apart from me, you can do nothing, also said, all things are possible with God. We are simply not smart enough or persuasive enough, but God's spirit can change the hardest hearts. And to close with one example, I once had the opportunity to speak by phone with the Sudanese man from a Muslim background about Jesus. He had long hated Christians and rejected Jesus as Lord. Yet God had done something in his heart, and when he began asking how to know Christ, I shared with him what it means to follow Jesus. And as I did, he interrupted. He said, no, no, I know the message. I just want to pray and believe in Jesus right now. Hmm. 
Hmm. He knew all the information, but it took God's power to open his eyes and create a moment where he was ready to pray and to believe. And we prayed together, and he continues to follow Jesus despite much persecution from his family. So, Dylan, if you're in the Dylan, we're going to have to go. Someone, please we'll start there. We're going to have to go, Dylan. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. You've been watching Stand in the Gap today. If you know Jesus Christ, your Savior, that's the place to start. Make sure that you know Jesus as Savior. Then understand that you are light. You are ambassadors. Open your mouth and let the Holy Spirit speak through you. You can be the best evidence that Jesus is God when people see the change in your life. And I pray that you do that. Now contact us this week. If you're enjoying this program, ladies and gentlemen, let us know that you are watching and that you are listening. God bless you.